الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان Assalamu alaikum my friends. Welcome to another episode of Revelation the Video Series. Super excited to have you here today. I'm Miraj Mohideen and we're going to be talking about um, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, in his teens. So there's not a lot of information that we have here uh, during the, the period of his time before prophethood, but I'm going to try to hit on some major points of this. I'm not going to be giving you every single detail. You can pick up more of those details uh, in uh, the book or in other uh, Sirah talks. But what I do want to mention, as you've noticed in the last few talks, is that I have been using excerpts from the Sirah series of Sheikh Yasser Qadi's Life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and also Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda's series from the Qalam Institute on the Life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I'm going to do a very shameless plug for both of these because these two series are some of the best discussions of Sirah that I have ever heard. And I've li I have come across a lot of material. As you can imagine, I've read a lot of books on Sirah. I've listened to a lot of talks on Sirah. There is no, I, I don't know any other uh, more exhaustive source on Sirah than these two lectures in the English language. Um, and so I highly encourage you guys to go and listen to both of those. They're huge volumes. There's over 100 lectures by Sheikh Yasser Qadi and over 150 or 200 lectures by Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda, but they're both probably equal in terms of material and volume. Sheikh Yasser's lectures are a little bit longer. And so I highly encourage you to go listen to all of those. They're better than whatever I am able to put together for you here today. Um, but it's definitely a lot more detail. And so I'm hoping if anything, if nothing else, that if those of you who are listening to this, this is just kind of an introductory um, Sira course that actually pushes you to go listen to the masters because their, their courses are just invaluable. Take your time with them. They're not going anywhere. And you can listen... Um, at length. The other thing I will say about them is they're very different in their style. Sheikh Yasser Qadi's uh, talks are very academic and very exacting, and I find them very reassuring to listen to because I know what he is telling me has been put through all of his intellectual filters and the rigors of academia that he understands. So you can kind of listen to what he says and take it to the bank. He will tell you, this is a weak hadith. This is not a weak hadith. You know, this is probably a story that didn't happen and so forth. Uh, and we'll get to that in, in this episode. There's some stories that he says actually didn't happen, which everyone reads and listens to. Uh, like Sheikh Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda series is also incredibly invaluable. It has a completely different flavor than the first one. Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda stories are also incredibly detailed, very voluminous. And what I like about his is that he has a lot of kind of breakout moments where he has these incredible discussions about how some of the things that are happening in the Prophet's life are incredibly relevant to us as individuals and as a community right now. And so... A very and with a lot of touching kind of personal reflections and narrations and so for those reasons when people ask me which one do you recommend listening to i say i can't you have to listen to both and maybe uh, based on your personality you're attracted to one style over the other style but i've listened to both of them i've, tra I've transcribed a lot of stuff from both of them and i'm planning on put using both of them in the next edition of revelation i've talked to them also uh, independently about using their material in my work and they've been supportive of me and i can only tell you please run and go listen to their stuff so anyway a little commercial break there now we're back to our regularly uh, scheduled program we're going to be talking about the life of the prophet muhammad in his teens the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, was under the care of Abdul Muttalib since the, uh, from the age of six to eight, and after that he was transferred to the care of Abu Talib. When Abdul Muttalib died, he didn't leave much inheritance to his children, and Abu Talib was not as well off as some of his other uncles. And for that reason, the Prophet Muhammad was, had to go to work right away to help support uh, Abu Talib's family. And what the Prophet did was he was a shepherd. He would uh, herd the, uh, his uncle's sheep all throughout the hills surrounding Mecca. What you will find is that so many of the prophets were shepherds. And if you, even amongst the Hebrew prophets, if you look at David, for example, and all the prophets before, the big leaders, 
They were all shepherds. Now, why was it important that so many of these prophets were shepherds? Well, if you look and listen to Sheikh Yasser Qadi's uh, lecture from his uh, for the eighth lecture in his series, he talks about some of the very important reasons why uh, the prophets were shepherds. Among some of them that I'll note, and I won't mention all of them here, is that he says, you have the opportunity for solitude as a shepherd. You get used to being alone in your thoughts. And that capacity to be alone creates a very reflective personality. And the prophets were incredibly reflective people who liked their solitude, who liked to reflect on life and to, to ponder Allah. So that's one. Number two, he mentions that sheep are very similar to men. They need to be taken care of or else they're going to go astray. He says, so another benefit of being a shepherd is that it trains you to treat each animal according to its unique disposition. Every animal needs to be guided according to its personality. And likewise, every human needs to be guided unto, uh, like, according to their personality. So you can't just give the same talk to every single person and assume it's going to have the same effect. you got to know each person in your flock and then give them what they need to help guide them to where they need to go. Finally, another one, a third one he says, is that it makes the shepherd soft and tender for your flock. And it teaches you how to be brave and courageous in protecting it from outsiders. Right? You love your sheep. You're gentle. You stroke them. You feed them. You make sure they're taken care of. So you're a very soft person around your sheep. But when there's a threat from the outside of the community, you have to be brave and you have to be strong to stop the wolf from coming. And that was some of the attributes that we see in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Another thing that Sheikh Yasir Qadi mentions is that a shepherd, the qualities of a shepherd, it, it inculcates um, qualities of patience, humbleness, humility, bravery, mercy, and tenderness. And, it, and he says it's not a surprise that the prophet was always very tender with animals throughout his life because he had this human-animal connection. You know, if I think about my own life, it's actually something that I feel that in, in our cultures, especially our immigrant cultures, we've become very removed from animals. Uh, you know, we, we don't farm, we don't have pets and this and that. And so when, a lot of times we look at animals as kind of like dirty things that we don't want to touch. But when you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was always in tune with animals. He was riding horses, he was with camels, he took care of sheep, he would, you know, pet them and stroke them. And so this was really the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And it was a way of the companions. Uh, you know, a couple other things that Sheikh Yasser mentions is that obviously by having a job, it taught the Prophet, peace be upon him, the value of earning money, helping the household, maintaining simplicity. And it says that he says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, showed us that there is no sin or dishonor in working for your own provision, meaning that it's very important that we all have jobs to make money and to bring money home so that we can provide for our families. And there's no shame in whatever that job is, so long as it is halal, that we work and we provide for our families. There's actually a blessing in that. Another story that we have from the teens of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, is that on one occasion he went with his uncle on a commercial caravan to Syria. So this is Abu Talib. And when he went on this uh, caravan, he came across a monk near Basra who was a Christian monk named Bahira. And for those of you who are not familiar with the story, most of you probably are, Bahira interacts with the, these people and then he calls for the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. And when he sees the Prophet, peace upon him, he confirms that he is very likely going to be the great prophet who everyone is anticipating. Now, I'm just mentioning this story to you right now because it is in many of the Sirah books, although Sheikh Yasser Qadi in his study of it feels that this is probably not a very authentic narration that happened with the Prophet, peace be upon him, but this is something in our Sirah literature that I'm mentioning to you right now. But a more important point about the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his teens is that he there's, there are narrations of him I guess you would use the word hanging out with other shepherds who were his age in Mecca. And on several occasions, they invited him to attend a party or something like that. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was never interested in inviting these parties. But on one occasion, he finally relented because he had pressured him so much. But he actually never attended that party because Allah had caused him to fall asleep before he entered the house where that party at party was at. But the bigger picture in this, and I think this is a really important conversation to be had because a lot of people probably who are listening to this right now have children and are concerned about how to raise children and so forth. It's a conversation that Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda talks about when it comes to children and how to raise teenagers. Do you protect them and lock them up uh, at home or do you let them just go out in society and experience all of what society has to offer? I want you to listen to what Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda has to say about this. So, this is a really, really fascinating story from the youth of the Prophet ﷺ in his young age and how he was a youth in that society. 
There's a very interesting balance here where he's a young man in that society. It's not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, locked him in a bubble to completely preserve and protect him. And then he was unlocked out of some, you know, uh, ice chamber and he was popped out of some bubble, you know, when he reached the age of 40, then now the Prophet has arrived. Right? That type of stuff is for comic books. But the Prophet ﷺ grew up in that society, was a young man in that society. All this stuff was going on around him. So he was cognizant of what was going on around him, but yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from being involved in such activity. Allah protected him. This is the isma of the Prophet ﷺ. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting and preserving and keeping the Messenger of Allah ﷺ pure, pristine. And so one of the lessons we learn from that is that Two things I wanted to mention specifically in light of this incident, what we can learn from that. Number one, we definitely want to protect our youth. And if young people are listening to this, you want to protect yourself. But at the same time, notice that for the Prophet ﷺ to be a da'i, for the Prophet ﷺ to go and preach and teach these people, he has to at least know where they're coming from. He has to at least have just a general idea of what goes on in society. So there's a protection, but yet not the word that we use, sheltering. The Prophet ﷺ hears these boys talking. He knows where the party's going on. He doesn't go in the party himself, but he knows that there's a party going on. So that when the time for preaching comes, the Prophet ﷺ has the ability to say, I know exactly what you guys are up to. I, am, I, I know what, you, what goes on. I understand you know, what you guys are involved in. But this is, this is why you shouldn't be doing those things. And that's the relevance that comes into the practicality and the relevance that comes into preaching and teaching. That's one thing. So you see where the Prophet has a job. And he's a young man. You know typically our idea of raising our youth, because the only way to protect them is, we have to lock them in the masjid. In the prayer hall of the masjid. Right? Just lock them up in the masjid, put a tasbih around their neck, Allah, Allah, that's it. And that's how they need to grow up. But the Prophet is out there in society and he's growing up and he has a job and there are other youth that he interacts with and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the divine tarbiyah of the Prophet you might say well Allah is doing the divine tarbiyah of the Prophet Allah is protecting the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa yes but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then through that, that same messenger the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadur Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Quran and gave us his life and those are our tools of tarbiyah now. We have guidelines, we have instruction in the book of Allah, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, so that we can let our youth and our children be regular people, regular human beings, being functional in society, but then instill within them the values and the tarbiyah and the discipline that is necessary to be able to make those types of decisions and to be able to stay away from bad and harmful things. And, but at the same time, one other lesson that we learn is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely intervened and made the Prophet pass out. That also this teaches us that sometimes we do have to intervene. You know, I always say we're a community of extremes. It's one way or the other. Either one approach to raising young people in this society, lock them up and throw away the key. And we'll figure out what happens with them later. Now if they become dysfunctional and they don't know how to function in society, then we'll deal with that later. The opposite extreme is, no, let them go out there, let them experience, let them live. Alright? Nearly kills himself, driving drunk, let them live, let them experience. That's how they'll learn. They say the bro thing, yeah? Right? That's how you learn. No, no, that's, that's, that's insanity. That's insanity. That's feeding your children to the wolves. There's a balance. Don't make them dysfunctional. Allow them to function in society and learn how to be a functional member of society. But at the same time, intervene when necessary. Put down the foot when necessary. Put some limitations when necessary. All right? And so we learn the balance of tarbiyah from the life of the Prophet wasallam. In other narrations from this period of his life, we understand that the Prophet, peace be upon him, other than being a shepherd, started training in archery and excelled at archery just like his great great ancestor. Who was that? Ismail, who was also known as an archer, 
And his archer was actually mentioned in the Bible as well. So Ismail Islam was an archer, a master archer. The Prophet peace upon him was a master archer. And that's why archery is a very strong sunnah in our tradition. It's actually something that I enjoy tremendously. I, I, I love it because it's something that's so much fun and it is a sunnah that you're practicing. The Prophet peace upon him emphasized things like archery and horseback riding, swimming and so forth. And it's something that keeps us active and whatnot. Even, you know, cons we consider one of the very greatest archers of our uh, tradition was Imam Ashafi, who was also a master archer. And so we learned that the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him learned this skill during this period of his life. Now, another event that happened during this period of life was the sacrilegious wars. It was a war that was happening between, or a battle that was happening between the Quraysh and some people outside of Mecca. It was an example of this endless cycle of violence that used to be pre prevalent amongst the Arabs. They never, you have to understand, the Arabs never had any centralized authority. It was not an empire. Arabia was just a bunch of tribes, kind of like, I don't want to use the word gangs because it's so pejorative to use the word gang, but in many ways, tribal culture was very much like gang culture. You had to stick with your own people, you had protection with your people, and if any gang outside of yours insulted or attacked one of your people, you had to get retribution. Because if you didn't get retribution, then people would think you're weak and they would continue to take advantage of you. So retribution was a norm. And this retribution would just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So there was this endless cycle of violence in Arabia, and the Prophet peace be upon him was very aware of that because he was growing up in this environment. So in this um, cycle of just uh, injustice and so forth, and a specific event happened, which was very important, which the Prophet peace be upon him mentioned in later years. And that event is called the Pact of Chivalry. Let me take you back for a second, explain to you what happened. There was a Yemeni merchant who was visiting Mecca and he was selling his goods to a local Meccan from the Confederate clan. So this is not the scented ones. This is not the clan of the Prophet, the clan of Hashem. This is the, his, the other side of Quraysh. And he was selling some stuff to, the, uh, to this Quraysh. But after they agreed to it, the Quraysh took the goods but refused to pay for it. So basically he ripped them off. And when this Yemeni merchant, who's a visitor, is saying, what are you doing? How can you rip me off like this? The Meccan is saying, no, I paid you. What are you going to do? You're going to tell people that I haven't paid you? You know, basically, who are you going to believe? And the Yemeni was so upset by this. He's like, how can you do this? Like, where's your sense of justice? And he was so upset by this that he publicly challenges the, the Quraysh to arbitrate the matter. He's basically saying, hey, like this place, this place of Mecca, this holy sanctuary, I just got ripped off. Who's going to defend me? Because I don't have any friends here in this foreign place. Because this guy just ripped me off. Who's going to defend me in this situation? So this becomes a very difficult situation for the Quraysh. Because the Confederates don't want to incriminate their brother, who is now um, you know, on the stand now for ripping off this visitor. And so they remain quiet. But there is a group of Quraysh from the scented ones who takes a stand on this. And the person who takes a stand and starts this pact of chivalry is the uncle of the Prophet, Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib. Remember, Zubair was the oldest brother of Abdullah, one of the sons of Abdul Muttalib. And Zubair, he hears this merchant's cry, and he tells the Quraysh, we have to do something about this. Well, ultimately, what happens? Several of the Quraysh meet up. None of them come from the scented ones except the clan of Adi, which happens to be the clan of Sayyidina Umar. Now, this is well before the conversion of Sayyidina Umar. But the people from the clan of Adi come to this meeting. Otherwise, it's just a meeting of the scented ones because they're the ones who are standing up for justice in this situation. And the Confederates don't want to incriminate one of their own. These people all get together and they resolved the matter with a man named Abdullah ibn Judan, who was a man from Taim, a very honorable, noble man. And the Taimis come together with the Hashimis, they come together with the people from the clan of Muttalib and Zuhra, and they all decide to write this thing called the Pact of Chivalry. It was a simple code of ethics 
Now, what did the Pact of Chivalry stand for? They basically said that each clan who was there would stand for the oppressed against the oppressor, regardless of who was doing the oppressing. It was basically saying we will stand for justice against injustice, even if we have to go against our own brothers in the process. So it was a very clear stand for justice. And it was such an incredible moment for the Quraysh or for these Quraysh that in many later years, the Prophet Muhammad reflected, peace be upon him, on this moment and said, I witnessed a confederacy in the house of Abdullah ibn Judan. It was more appealing to me than herds of cattle. Even now, in the period of Islam, I would respond positively to attending such a meeting if I was invited. The Prophet, peace upon him, loved Abdullah ibn Judan and he loved the nobility of the people who came together and stood for justice against injustice, even though they were non-Muslim, even though this was for the, before the period of Islam. What we learn is that in Islam, you stand up and you support any institution, anything, Muslim or, not, or non-Muslim, that stands for against oppression and for truth and for justice. Now, here's my favorite part to the story. Who was present at the Pact of Chivalry? Well, like I said, you had these leaders like Abdullah ibn Judan, Judan and you had um, Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib, these elder chieftains of Quraysh. But some of them brought some of the younger teens to the meeting so they could be a part of this and witness this. And two teenagers who were sitting there were none other than Muhammad ibn Abdullah and Abu Bakr ibn Quhafa. These were two friends and they were both at the same meeting together decades before the first revelation was ever revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with that image, I'm going to end this section of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, in his teens. I kind of went through it pretty quickly, but I want to give you some of the salient features of this. Um, in the next episode, we're going to talk about the life of the Prophet Muhammad in his uh, 20s and then into his 30s. Uh, one thing I want to just uh, let you know of, if you want to get a really good understanding of what Meccan society was like during this period in the Prophet's life, I would encourage you to go listen to lecture number three in Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda's uh, Sira uh, series. Uh, in that, he'll t give an excellent description about the social, cultural, and economic, and ethical traditions of pre-Islamic Arabia. And he'll include a really um, solid understanding of the good and the bad of Mecca. Meaning he'll talk about topics like slavery, fornication, prostitution, class mobility, elitism, honor, hospitality, forbearance, illiteracy, and poetry. And so it's a really powerful talk to give you a strong sense of what was going on there. And it'll help you understand the Quran and the context within which the Quran was revealed. What I will just say is this. It's very important when we talk about the life of the Arabs before the coming of Islam is that it's very easy for people to just say, oh, that was the period of Jahiliya. And when we say the Jahiliya period or the age of ignorance, that's true, that's what we call it. But it's, it's all too convenient to just say everything was horrible in that period of time, because that's certainly not the case. The Meccans, yes, there was prostitution, there was fornication, there was slavery, there was adultery, there was elitism and racism. Yes, they had all that. Most societies had that, and most societies today have even more of that. But that being said, it's really important to have a balanced approach when you're looking at this stuff and understand that the Arabs also had nobility, they had generosity, they had hospitality, they had poetry, they had an appreciation for the arts. And so it's really important to have a very balanced understanding of history and not to have this black and white approach, not only to places, but also to people. People are as complicated, if not more complicated, than the societies they're in. And as we go and look at the times and the companions and even the enemies of the companions uh, and the Prophet, peace upon them, it's really important to approach it with a sense of maturity, understanding that people are complex, societies are complex, and sometimes even the worst of people, like Abu, uh, like Abu Sufyan, had a level of nobility in him that you have to appreciate. Okay. Even people who were the best of companions, they also struggled with certain vices. And that's what makes them that much more human and relatable to us. So on that note, we're going to end this episode. I hope this was helpful for you. I hope you're enjoying the commentary. Please let me know in the comments what you think of the commentary that I am able to include in this. Um, meanwhile, uh, in the next episode, we're going to talk about the Prophet's life, peace be upon him, in his 20s and 30s. Uh, feel free to share this with anyone who you think might benefit from it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. I will see you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum. 